Right now, it's my pleasure to introduce a colleague and a friend um, who is here to talk to us about some impactful research that has been going on significant to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. John Moyer is a professor of community health and pediatrics and is also the director of the Institute for Health and Equity at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He's a co-principal investigator of the Fight COVID Milwaukee Project that we'll be talking about today that's funded by the National Institute of Health to the Medical College of Wisconsin Clinical and Translational Science Institute. That's a mouthful so early in the morning, isn't it? Dr. Moyer cares for patients and teaches resident physicians at the Children's Midtown Health Center, so some of you might recognize Dr. Moyer. For 12 years, he has led the institute of 150 faculty, staff, and doctoral students that do research and graduate education in biostatistics, epidemiology, social sciences, global health, bioethics, medical humanities, public and community health, genetic counseling, and precision medicine. Wow. Well, students are having a lot of impact around our whole community and our world, aren't they? Dr. Moyer has been honored with the Medical College of Wisconsin Distinguished Service Award, the President's Community Engagement Award, Society for Teaching Scholars, the AOA National Medical Honor Society Award, and Best Doctors in America. He is grateful to his MCW and Children's Wisconsin's collaborators, community partners, family, and friends for vital support. He's here today with some essential collaborators on the, re on the research project he'll be sharing today, and some of you will recognize these, these folks, Dr. Desi Levy and Ms. Priscilla Wallace. So at this point, I ask you to join us. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dr. Desi Levy. I'm an assistant professor and assistant director in the Clinical Translational Science Institute at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, I appreciate Dr. Moyer, some of my experience. I've, I'm a longtime um, Milwaukee native. I have served uh, over 17 years in the institutions of higher learning. I am Wisconsin's first African-American to serve as a dean for the School of Health Sciences at Milwaukee Area Technical College. I also um, am very active in the community and particularly the faith community. My late husband was the uh, pastor of the True Love Missionary Baptist Church along with the president of the General Baptist State Convention of Wisconsin. I just also like to take the time this morning to acknowledge my new pastor who has come this morning to support me, uh, Reverend John K. Patterson. He is here somewhere. So um, I just wanted to make sure that uh, kudos and accolades are given where they are due because he too has been a, a relevant part of this process and journey for me. Hi, my name is Priscilla Wallace. Um, I am the program director of the Fight COVID Milwaukee Project, as well as the program manager of all of us. Um, I have spent eons, years in the community, engaging, working in Head Start, 16 years at the Social Development Commission. So I am among family and friends. Um, it has been a pleasure to work in the health industry, educating the community about the disparities and how we can not only educate them, but what we can make as a difference um, and how they can better be equipped to make a change in terms of how they can uh, grow and know more about what they can do differently to be healthy. So enjoy. Good morning. It is really a deep honor to be invited by SDC to share at the Poverty Summit. And I truly have enjoyed the amazing collaboration with Dr. Desi Levy and Ms. Priscilla Wallace. We're gonna be sharing with you our journey, our work to do community-engaged research and talk first about the partnerships and then about the science. And finally, what we need to do together to continue to advance well-being in our community.
So just to give you a brief overview of the objectives that we have for our presentation today and explaining the work that we've been doing, we're hoping that everyone walks away with the understanding of the importance of community engagement when conducting community-based participatory research. We also hope that you are able to apply any new promising practices and strategies for the development and maintaining of equitable communities, um, particularly community and academia research partnerships. So the work we're going to share with you is funded by our National Institutes of Health. And in response to the COVID pandemic, they developed a uh, RADx up program, a rapidly accelerated diagnostic testing for underserved populations. Most of the sites, over 100 across the country, are focused on COVID infection tests, the PCR tests, the swab you might get in your nose or throat. We chose to focus on antibody tests to understand how our bodies were responding to the virus or maybe not. I'm sorry. So the aims of the project, first we wanted to collect and analyze that COVID antibody test. We wanted to analyze surveys and the results of those and take a good look at the health records. We wanted to create and update a COVID risk assessment tool for individuals. And then we wanted to take a look at the big data and assess the infections, vaccines, and the deaths by individual and community characteristics. So sharing with you about um, our partnerships, as I mentioned at the top, we have uh, actually have two major, major partners here uh, in Wisconsin that um, you all may be familiar with because they've been existing for quite some time. Uh, we targeted our faith communities because we do believe at MCW that uh, those are doors of opportunity to uh, partner and build transitional relationships across the city and across the state. So we started with the um, General Baptist State Convention of Wisconsin. Uh, the General Baptist, just to give you a little bit of history about it, it is a 149-year-old organization. It's 98 years old here in the state of Wisconsin. We have over 7.5 million members under the auspices of the National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated. The National Baptist Convention USA Incorporated established a HOPE ministry, as HOPE stands for Health, Ed Outreach, Prevention, and Education Ministry that actually uh, began working in communities like here in Milwaukee with the uh, RADx Up pro program. The, State Convention is led by Reverend Dr. Frederick Jones. He is the pastor of the Canaan Baptist Church here in Milwaukee. And um, again, our HOPE ambassadors have advocated and navigated us through the antibody testing. We are also National Institute of Health Partners. We were the and are the first faith-based organization to receive funding from the NIH to promote the All of Us research program that you'll hear more about later. Um, we also partnered with the uh, Word of Hope Hit Ministry here in Milwaukee, located on 40th and Center at the uh, Holy Cathedral Church of God in Christ under the uh, wonderful leadership of Bishop C.H. McClellan. And um, the Word of Hope ministry has existed for since the early 1970s. Uh, it uh, targets mentorship, youth pr uh, prison reentry programs, job placement, ATO, a uh, counseling, and it has served over 40,000 individuals throughout uh, the years, individuals and their families. We want to make sure that uh, we included these partnerships because, again, the faith community is a trusted community across our network. And we want to give special thanks to our Distinguishing Community Advisory Board, 
Um, they challenged us, they stood by us, uh, and they asked the hard questions. Those individuals, Albert Brown, who represented the General Baptist State Convention of Wisconsin, Elizabeth Cox, Northcott Neighborhood House, Ella Dunbar, the Social Development Commission, Howard Fuller, Marquette University College of Education, Lisa Coons Guru, YWCA of Milwaukee, Nicholas Ramos, City of Milwaukee Mayor's Office, Sophia Abaji, Medical College of Wisconsin, Wisconsin, and Velma King, a community representative. Also, in describing what community engagement, we have to look at some very key points. Community-based participatory research. One of the, some of the things that we have to do is you have to listen intensively to the community. We have to respect the differences in, what, in ideas. You have to have an act of humility as well as develop trust between the two parties. The faith community focuses not on spirituality, but also on wellness of the mind and the body. And then a diverse community, ad, ad, excuse me, and then having a diverse community advisory board with monthly meetings. In our effort to outreach, the community, within our community, we held nine pop-ups and recruitment events. Those were held at churches, our community partners, during food pantries, during job fairs, during the COVID vaccine outreaches. We also had the help of our health ambassadors, as Dr. Levy was talking about, with the health outreach prevention and education ministries of the Baptist Convention. We did paid ads and radio advertisements through the local community um, newspapers that marketed our black and brown community. And we sent out over 230,000 letters and emails to more than 20 primary care health center participants. And we enrolled, because we were in the middle of a pandemic, through our websites, through emails, by phone calls, and through Zoom, in any way that made our clients and our participants feel safe, both in English and in Spanish. And while doing this, we made sure that our information and our publications resembled those that we were trying to reach. So our photos um, was reflective of the community that we were targeting. So one of the uh, things that we appreciate is the challenges of misinformation and the frank reality of distrust particularly among historically marginalized communities. The Medical College of Wisconsin is one of 150 medical schools that's a member of the Association of American Medical College. Fredert, Children's Hospital, Zablocki VA are one of 400 teaching hospitals that are part of AAMC. And our National Association has come up with um, a dozen lists of principles of trustworthiness, what we need to do in academics, in teaching, in research to earn the trust of the community. For example, the community is already educated. They're experts with lived experience. That's why it might not trust us. You're not the, the only experts, academics. Our community are experts and can offer advice, practical wisdom about how to proceed. And without action, our organization pledge is only performance. An office of community engagement isn't sufficient. It doesn't start or end with our wonderful community advisory board. Diversity is more than skin deep. There's more than one gay, one black church, and one bodega in our community. We need to show our work, show our preliminary results, interact with the community on a continually improve. And if we're going to do it, we need to take the time and do it right. And 
The project might be over, the NIH funding might end, but the work is not. We need to sustain those partnerships and collaborations to address many challenges in health and upstream factors that affect our well-being. So, in sharing some of the successes and the challenges uh, that we faced in the process of uh, going to and fro across uh, Southeast Milwaukee, should I say, um, the study uh, had a particular value in terms of the COVID antibody test, uh, raised awareness of the protection from the vaccine and or uh, past infections. So yours truly participated. <laughs> and what we mean by that is that we drew uh, samples of blood. Yes, we used a needle to poke me and somebody had to hold my hand. <laughs> Um, but the results of the uh, antibody test uh, actually revealed, and I, I can disclose because these are my results, my antibody test results were at a level where chances are um, the vaccines that I took along with the boosters indicated that I was protected, my antibodies had reacted to the vaccine the way that it was supposed to. So information like this we took to uh, the community and began to explain uh, through eight educational science cafes via Zoom, of course, uh, that actually showed the support and promised to promote the understanding of what COVID uh, testing and protection actually mean. Because you can assume that because I've had the antibody uh, test and or the vaccine booster and maybe even COVID that you're protected, but the results actually speak. And back in the beginning of COVID, when we were talking about following the science, this was part of the science that we were asking each individual, and particularly in Milwaukee, 18 and over, uh, to follow the science so that we could better understand to get us to the point of where we are today. The focus groups that we held were approximately 79 in uh, diverse communities, both black, brown, um, uh, in our white colleague communities. And also we talked about the experiences and the views of their COVID risk and protection and how to improve communication and the risk. Because again, we were faced with the hesitancy, particularly in black and brown communities of wanting to uh, either receive the COVID vaccination and or booster and or even participate in antibody testing. We actually ended up um, partnering with a predominantly uh, Spanish speaking church on the city south side that actually came out in droves to have themselves evaluated and assessed. On the right side of this particular slide is showing you uh, where we are with those who have totally completed in Wisconsin the vaccine series, which is the first two shots that you received probably last year, and hopefully somebody is still receiving some to get us up to 100%. But I do want to draw your attention to the far right side of the uh, graph, where it's showing us um, particularly where black and brown and um, Native Americans are falling in terms of that 61%. Um, and it is one of the social determinants of health as we've newly identified it. So the, what are the next steps for our partnership and our collaborations? We're gonna be continuing our educational science cafes with the latest information from our own research as well as others, and sharing approaches to being safe, and as well as what are the risks um, and how to proceed. Our next Science Cafe is actually with uh, the General Baptist and Word of Hope group this Saturday, expecting about 70 people at the El Bethel Church. Uh, we had many diverse clinical research coordinators hired by the Medical College of Wisconsin, many having no experience in research, coming from medical assistant backgrounds, and they learn phlebotomy, they learn to work with community, they love interacting with the participants and hearing their stories, providing support, and the vast majority have stayed on with rewarding careers uh, at MCW. The community and primary care clinic partners learned about things like relying on the MCW IRB to ensure protection of human participants. 
training in how to protect people and explain uh, respecting their autonomy and decision making, the benefits and risks of the research, uh, that the, the fact that they could drop out at any time, et cetera. And formal research agreements and providing funding for the important role that they played in promoting our project, providing space for us while they were incredibly busy serving patients with COVID, starting vaccines, and doing their day-to-day -day services. That sets the stage for those partnerships for future projects, building on our relationships with the faith community and other community agencies, working with primary care centers that hadn't done research before. So in as example, we uh, recently at MCW earned a National Institute of Minority Health Disparities grant to the Center for AIDS Intervention Research. They've developed expertise at care working with the LGBT community on communication and approaching risk. So what they're doing is working with Progressive Health Center and their patients to think about the value of social networks, how our relationships allow us to communicate information with one another and try to keep each other safe. And so they're assessing social networks as a way to get folks to be uh, accepting of the COVID vaccine. Another research program that we have is the NIH funding of the All of Us program. Um, through that program, we are looking to recruit one million people across the United States um, to collect data that allows researchers to improve the way we deliver health care, moving from a one-size-fits-all to a more precise framework of, called precision medicine. An example of this is hypertension, 12 medications, going starting from one list all the way down to being more precise, a Hispanic male, top three meds based on their DNA and genetics makeup. Currently, we have 5,000 participants enrolled in the program. We have 2,600 studies going. Um, in the area that I'm more particularly interested in is Alzheimer's, and they have 23 studies that's going on. Participants receive information on their ancestry background and their genetic information and a ton of health resources. If you're interested, feel free to see me or there's a booth in the back area that you can get more information or our website, allofus.org. In addition, CTSI is growing community engagement partnerships with Word of Hope Ministry and General Baptist Convention of Wisconsin for research, education, healthcare, and spiritual well-being. So there's other initiatives that are going on. We're building long-term mutual trust that enhances community academic partnerships for COVID research and for other health research and education collaborations. Um, so again, just um, to piggyback on what uh, Priscilla has presented about the All of Us Research Program, our organization, the uh, General Baptist, our national partners, again, with the National Institute of Health, uh, we received uh, federal funds to go from church to church, and you don't have to be Baptist, you can be any, any denomination, uh, actually educating and encouraging our um, uh, communities to be participants. This is a national broad uh, effort, so it's not just here in Wisconsin with the Wisconsin Consortium. What the NIH saw in the National Baptist was the continuity across the country and its ability to spread information under our HOPE Ambassadors uh, program. What you see here on the screen is, a, a, is an example of two of our uh, HOPE ambassadors that have actually helped us navigate the RADx uh, process in antibody testing and fighting COVID here in, in Wisconsin. Our advice from going and ongoing, for ongoing and learning practices uh, was really to go into the communities and show the humility and vulnerability that we have as researchers, as well as understanding the uh, humility and the vulnerability that exists within our families. 
We also uh, were encouraged to show respect in terms of the assets that are had, the strengths and the lived experiences. What you all, what we all bring to the table um, is highly valued, but oftentimes in the area of research, I share this with my colleagues, Dr. Moyer was kind enough and understanding enough to, as we began this RADx piece, go to the table, get the individuals that we're looking at to ask and invite to these studies and participate in the studies, getting an understanding from their lens as to what it is that we're doing that could help benefit them and their families. Ask questions with genuine curiosity. Don't just ask the questions, uh, researchers, as um, what it is on your piece of paper. Understand that when you're in Rome, the cliche says you do as the Romans. And so a lot of times, some, for example, when we go to the faith community, the order of a, of a service, service don't start without prayer. Service doesn't start without reading of the scripture. So even though you may not be of that faith, you may not even be of a believer, but if you're in that environment, you're going to follow a set schedule and agenda as identified by them. Next, you wanted to we uh, learned by visiting community sites and listening intently to their ideals and incorporating. If it was best for us to do a pop-up clinic on a Saturday or a Sunday when we caught the majority of the congregations after a worship service, then we took our show to the road and went out on a Saturday and Sunday. Community-based participatory research is not Monday through Friday, nine to five. And then we uh, shared uh, extensive amount of resources in helping individuals to participate in the decision making of either being part of Fight COVID Milwaukee and or all of us. So I hope you appreciate how critical, how vital, how essential those community partnerships are for us to do research. Research that guides our education, research that guides our patient care, and ultimately that helps us work together to optimize the well-being of our communities. Now we want to share a bit of what we learned from the science and where we might go next. So uh, our, our, we designed our project as a randomized study. And what we hoped for is to get 20,000 people to participate. But as we pointed out, it takes time to connect with, fam with community. We had to go through the IRB process. We had to work with primary care sites that had top priority serving their patients. So there were a number of things that slowed down and delayed our processes. And of course, we need folks who are interested in wanting to uh, participate. So our project started in September 2020. Our first participant enrolled in March. Uh, we continued enrolling through June of this year. And then we had our final follow-up antibody test in September. And we have so much data to analyze and understand. We'll be continuing that work through May of 2023. I've been honored to play a leadership role in this work, particularly with my passion for working with community. Dr. Reza Shakir is the leader of our Clinical Translational Science Institute. That was the department or institute that received the grant from the NIH at MCW. And Bernie Black is a lawyer who's an expert in quasi-experimental design and study design um, for complex uh, analyses. And together, we've worked with an amazing team of academic community partners, and we'll tell you a bit more about what we learned. So when we look at AIM-1, our recruitment enrollment in study of COVID antibody tests, the surveys, the electronic health records, and the Medicaid AIMS, and sending out the 230,000 letters and emails to adult patients in the 20 primary care health care centers, um, dealing with the community engagement and the recruitment through our local churches, our nonprofit partners, and our community advisory boards, uh, our radio ads and newspaper ads, our outreach to more than 250,000 Medicaid enrollees in Milwaukee, we were able to enroll 4,150 individuals into our project. With that, 42% of them were people, black 
of black and brown um, participants. 20% 20, 20 of them were Medicaid participants, and 47% of them were Medicare, Medicare participants. Their ages were from 18 to 89, and two-thirds of them were women. The surveys that um, we uh, distributed actually uh, yield the results of 24% uh, of the individuals had had positive COVID PCR tests. The Milwaukee, in Mil the Milwaukee underestimated uh, PCR incidence of 35%. Um, the uh, Hispanic was 25% black individuals I'm sorry, I'm reading it backwards. Um, the PCR incidence of 35% Hispanic, 25% black, and 20% white, meaning that that's how that 24% broke down. We proposed antibody tests for better prevalence estimated. Um, and so again, 11% had long COVID uh, symptoms, fatigue, brain fog, headache, um, congestion that won't go away, those are all considered long COVID symptoms. Anxiety, depression, insomnia, and dys, uh, dyspnea, which is a shortness of breath, uh, as the one that actually ended up leading making the news. 47% had families, family members with COVID, and 7% had family members die of COVID. Um, it was important for us, again, we are overall aim was really looking at individuals that had not received the uh, vaccination. And so we ended up with a large majority, 90% of the people studied had received vaccinations. Um, particularly in Milwaukee, 80% were older than 55. It's a group out there that's 55, right? <laughs> Y'all. <laughs> 60% uh, Hispanic and, and white uh, made up uh, that per percentage of 80% that had been vaccinated and 45% black. But if you look at these numbers again, particularly for black African Americans that had been vaccinated, we fall short. We had an oversampling um, of vaccinated and so the antibody test that we did was not a, a good enough population as we had estimated to be unvaccinated. So we were on the track to get vaccinated and we showed up because we were vaccinated, but those that were really in that hesitancy mode or denial mode or just saying, I don't want the vaccinated were the ones that didn't rise to the surface. Finally, 8% reported being um, Im immunocompromised, but many had COVID antibodies. Immunocompromised is someone who have undergone maybe chemo, um, maybe HIV positive, those type of individuals. So 8% of our study actually reported being Im immunocompromised. So this is a cartoon of the COVID virus. You might have seen it. Uh, the red little um, knobs on the outside are called the spike protein. And when this tiny, tiny little virus gets inside our body, our nose, our throat, our lungs, it connects to receptors that are on the cells in our lungs and other areas, and then it penetrates or goes inside the cell, and it uses the cell to replicate, to reproduce, to copy. So that spike protein is really important. And the vaccines that are out there, like Pfizer and Moderna, are designed specifically to recognize that spike protein and block it from going into the cell. Inside is something called the nucleocapsid. It's covered by a little shell. And we can make antibodies in our own bodies to the nucleocapsid when it breaks open, but the vaccines are not specific to the capsid. The, the, the vaccines are specific to the spike protein. So when we measure antibody levels, the antibodies reflect somebody that got a vaccine that worked. It might reflect that they had an infection with the spike protein and their antibodies fought that off. When we measure the nucleocapsid antibodies, 
It's from infection only. It's not from the vaccine. So people who got the vaccine wanted to know, did I make antibodies? Did I make a lot of them? I'm older, I got diabetes, I've got cancer treatment. Is it working? And what level of antibodies do I have? And how long do they last? And do they actually protect me? Those are the kinds of questions we wanted to answer with our community partners to understand what works. And you're hearing now, there's new vaccines, do they work? There's antibody tests going on, and there's measures of people ending up in the hospital or passing away. The research continues to understand this incredibly awful pandemic. So these are cross sections. If we look at the group of participants month to month, going back to March, April of 2021, up through June of 2022, you see two bars. The orange bar is the spike protein antibody. And if 90% of our participants got the vaccine, even if they're immunocompromised, we'd hope that they made some antibodies. And we actually can measure quantitatively, is it a low amount? Is it a medium amount? Is it sky high? And even that 89-year-old gentleman had sky-high antibodies, which was really heartwarming and protective. The blue represents the nucleocapsid antibodies. And you can see that exposure to infection in this group of participants who were 90% vaccinated was pretty low. Going back to that original virus, and then in July of 2021, the Delta spike that happened, still pretty protected. And then all of a sudden, December and January roll around Omicron. Omicron. Omicron spread like crazy. And even among this population of participants who were pretty good at protecting themselves, we see this big surge in January through May on the order of 20, 25% of people showing signs they'd been infected, even if they'd been vaccinated or not. We wanted all comers. And interestingly, other studies have shown that half of people who got infected during that Omicron surge didn't know it. They had a common cold symptom. And they, of course, may have been walking around spreading it to others who might have been much more vulnerable. That's our first aim, working with community, learning about antibodies. And we continue to analyze linked data with the gracious permission of those participants surveys, antibody tests, electronic health records, and Medicaid. The value of that information is it can tell us with precision about all the chronic conditions people have, the comorbidities. You probably have heard that people with diabetes or heart disease might be greater risk of severe COVID illness. We want to know not only if they have diabetes, but what's their hemoglobin A1C? How severe is their diabetes? And the only way we can know that with reliability is actually get the lab results from their health records. And our participants gave us permission to look at that information. We gather their information, we link it, survey, antibody, electronic record, and strip the identifiers. So the data we analyze never has anybody's personal identifiers, but it is linked information to do really important analyses. Our second aim was, all right, you've been studying protection and risk, how do we communicate about it? How do we raise awareness and help people appreciate the relative risk of COVID compared to other stuff? So we created an individual COVID risk estimator. There's estimators out there for things like heart disease. Mm -hmm. You can put into a chart in the web that's anonymous, your age, race, ethnicity, gender, whether you have high blood pressure, diabetes, what your LDL cholesterol is, and it will report out your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. We use the same approach with our data to put together a tool for our community and beyond. So behind the data, behind the, the risk tool, is real data, real information that informed our science. So we got a sample of one out of 20 people in Medicare seniors from across the country, millions of records helping us understand COVID risks. We also 
gratefully have received from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services information about deaths, deaths from COVID, deaths from other stuff, natural causes, et cetera. We also have similar information from the entire state of Indiana, from Cook County, Illinois, and this past week we just got permission for the entire state of Illinois. So we have data from Medicare across the country and three Midwest states to inform what's going on. We also had preliminary tools, examples of our risk tool. It had some tables with numbers. It was just put out there without any verbal information. And we had focus groups with nearly 80 people of diverse backgrounds to say, what do you like about the tool? How can we make it better? And they told us, more charts and graphs, less numbers. Have somebody narrate a little story that explains how to use the tool, Miss Priscilla Wallace's voice, providing that guidance for them. So their guidance helped us make the tool more user-friendly and approachable. We have had more than 40,000 people use our individual risk tool without any major advertising about it. It's word of mouth spreading. It searches on the web. And it's not just participants in Milwaukee. We've had 15% of our participants from Chicago, New York City, and Los Angeles. So the word's getting out. And what we hope to do is update it with our latest research through June, death records that we've just got updated recently, with vaccine data. How effective are the vaccines? And if you get one, two, three, or more, and then hopefully get a news story in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, which of course has a relationship with USA Today, and then we can get the word out nationally about a tool that we think is one of the best around. So here's an example of the tool. It would be a blank, blank sheet, and you can actually go to fightcovidmilwaukee.org, individual risk estimator, and check it out. So you get a blank sheet, and you can put in your age and this other information, completely anonymous. The research team doesn't collect this information. All we do is count how many folks get it, and can we tell from their URL where they live. So here's an example that I put into the tool. This gentleman's 65 years old. He's an African-American background and lives in zip 53206. He's average height and a bit overweight. He said he's got diabetes and high blood pressure, but no trouble with coronary artery disease, with lung problems. He doesn't have kidney disease or cancer. He doesn't have heart failure, stroke, or dementia. So of course, you'd say, well, dementia, somebody else can put the data in for him with his permission and explore. It's anonymous. And you could play around with scenarios and out of curiosity. So once this gentleman put in this information, a couple charts show up at the website that are confidential and private. The first one is the risk of dying from COVID for people who are like him. People who are seniors, African American, living in a lower income community, with uh, diabetes, uh, with a little bit overweight. So people like him. This doesn't predict what's going to happen to him individually. It's a population perspective. It's epidemiology. It's how we think about community health, public health. So the first thing I want you to notice is the little yellow bar on the left. That's the risk of getting COVID and dying if the prevalence of COVID in the community is low. Notice the green bar, much, much lower. That's if he had a past COVID vaccine or a past COVID infection, because either of those might offer antibody protection. The next one you notice is the bar goes up in the middle. That's when we move to a medium risk level, and the risk of dying or getting sick is much greater. Milwaukee, a few weeks ago, was low risk. We've now moved up to medium risk because of hospitalizations. And then the far right yellow bar is really high. That's when the risk of COVID in the community is very high. It's very prevalent. Lots of people have it. That was the Omicron surge in the spring. So you can see the risk goes up as infections more prevalent in the community. And in every case, the risk is much, much lower if vaccinated or past infection. The second chart on the bottom 
is a relative risk. All right, there's some risk that I might die of COVID. I might die of something else. I'm a senior. I've got diabetes. I have some other vulnerabilities. You can see on this one, it's comparing COVID to other common risks. And for this particular gentleman, it is true. His risk of dying from cancer is greater than his risk of dying from COVID. It helps us to kind of get a relative risk and appreciation. But you'll notice his risk of dying from COVID are much greater than dying from the flu or pneumonia or a car crash. So that helps us to get a relative sense of how real is my risk. And if I put in a young white woman living in Shorewood who's got no health conditions, that risk changes. Her greatest risk is dying from a car crash. And second is COVID. The third thing we want to do in our project is look at all this big data, huge amounts. 4,000 people locally, all of Milwaukee County COVID vaccines, every PCR test, positive or negative, every death. We've got an amazing database. We strip the identifiers. We don't know the names of the people, but it helps us to do a better understanding of big populations to get to the truth, to add to our science and understanding, and to use mechanisms with community to communicate. So we're linking Milwaukee, and we're currently working with the state on getting statewide data. So we have information not on a million, but on seven million people, not just urban, but rural as well, to look at vaccine effectiveness, about how infections might protect people or make them at risk, specific medical diagnoses, and of course, the tragedy of people dying. And we're looking especially at the effect of vaccines. Our current work, adding to the literature shows that as you get more vaccines from one Moderna Pfizer to two to a booster, that your protection does get better. And if you had a past infection, better still. But if you just had past infection and no vaccines, more vulnerable. And it looks to us like the Moderna vaccine works a bit better than Pfizer, and it particularly became popular among seniors who are the greatest risk. We're interested in life expectancy loss, where we've seen the greatest tragedies are in our Hispanic and, and black communities, especially Hispanic men. And we're not exactly sure why. It's probably a variety of factors, essential workers, bigger families. Uh, we're trying to understand that better. But disproportionate burden, especially among younger Hispanic men and women. We're looking at population death rates, and also how COVID risk is for dying compared to other things like cancer and car crashes. So you could Google this now, the Milwaukee County COVID surveillance dashboard. Tons of data out there. I take a look at this every week and I share it with my church group. They want to know what's the risk in our community. And the Centers for Disease Control has said, let's use some of these charts that are on the, the um, screen to inform us if it's low, medium, or high risk. Because lower risk, if you're younger and pretty healthy, you might feel comfortable without a mask. But when it's higher risk, it might be time to mask up and most certainly try to be protected with vaccines. So COVID cases were pretty high in uh, May, and then now they've dropped down into the green zone, relatively low, still mostly Omicron. The middle chart is hospital admissions. And you can see we dipped our toe into the green zone a few weeks ago, and then we bumped back up. So COVID hospitalization is still much more common among unvaccinated than vaccinated, much more common among seniors than younger, much more common for people that have chronic health conditions than that are completely well. And then finally, we look at inpatient beds. Because in the height of the crisis, we set up State Fair Park for extra hospital beds because we reached capacity. And if we're taking care of a lot of people with COVID, we can't take care of people with cancer and heart attacks as well. So that's also something that you do for others. Uh, if you can reduce the COVID risk in your household, your social network, you reduce the risk that we have the unintended consequences of overwhelming our healthcare system. 
So how good is that vaccine? Well, look at the age-adjusted rates of COVID-associated hospitalizations by vaccine, vaccination status. So this is people who are adults from January 2021 through August of 2022. So it takes us right through Delta in the summer of last year and Omicron the spring of this year. And what you notice is the blue is the vaccine levels of hospitalization. The green is people who are not vaccinated. And it's green has always been higher and especially that incredible spike January with Omicron. Complementary stuff I shared earlier, Omicron infections among people who are trying to be safe. Half of people not even knowing. Incredible vulnerability. And if I put up a chart of deaths, same thing. Unvaccinated, so much greater risk than people who are vaccinated. So the current advice about the COVID vaccines are listed here. You've heard that in the last couple months, there's this new bivalent booster. And the bivalent has protection against the original COVID virus, the first vaccines that came out from Pfizer and Moderna. And it also has protection about, around the Omicron, the BA variants that you've heard about. And this COVID virus isn't stopping. It's continuing to mutate. That's its natural biologic evolutionary process and it's trying to figure out ways to evade our immune processes, whether it's Mother Nature protecting us or vaccines. So just like influenza, every year trying to stay ahead, trying to guess, but the vaccines for COVID are so much more precise than we've ever had for influenza. Absolutely amazing technology that didn't happen in a year. We've been working on this stuff, mRNA and viruses, for a decade. Fortunately, the timing was perfect for us to offer it uh, within a year after COVID breaking out. So the CDC recommends everybody stay up to date on your COVID shots. Kids and teens ages six months to 17 years, adults 18 and up, get a COVID vaccine after you recover from an infection. It provides added protection against COVID and you might wait a little bit, chat with your doc or public health person. And if you recently had COVID, you might consider delaying your vaccine primary or the booster by three months from when your symptoms started or you had no symptoms. And people who are moderately or severely immunocompromised, they know it. They told us on their test, uh, their surveys. So you might have different recommendations and need a couple boosters a year. Uh, listen to your doc which ones might be best for you. And it's not just COVID. Influenza, it was quiet when we were wearing a lot of masks a year ago. But there's big concerns about the outbreaks we see in the southern hemisphere, places like Australia, that we could be in for a doozy of a year. And getting both COVID and influenza at the same time could be really a rough ride. So getting both COVID and flu protection is really highly advised. And you might have heard that the children's hospitals across the country are being overwhelmed by RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, bronchiolitis in little babies, bad colds in older kids, complications with ear infections, lots of kids sadly in the critical care unit, little tiny premature babies. So that one's harder. We don't have, a, we've got a uh, vaccine we give to former preemies, but it's not for everybody. So the masks do work to protect those little tiny people who are vulnerable to things like RSV. Last thing I want to really highlight is where can you get really reliable, good, culturally sensitive information. I highly recommend healthymilwaukee.com. Um, it has information about tools, the latest data, partners, connecting, working information about testing and vaccines and getting healthcare and access. Five different languages established by Empower, a black women-owned agency in the Harambe neighborhood, zip code 53206. Absolutely terrific, it's got incredible support from healthcare and uh, health plans, uh, but really led by community leaders to communicate effectively about what's going on and how to be safe. So we have been deeply honored to share what we've learned with community about COVID. And uh, Dr. Desi Levy, Ms. Priscilla Wallace and I would be happy to hear your comments, uh, entertain your questions uh, in some remaining minutes. Thank you so much.
morning, and thank you for that great presentation. Hello, Desi. Good morning, Barbara. <laughs> I have two questions. I'd like to know, or if you know, how long or what is the time frame for those who've gone through chemo before they are no longer considered immunocompromised when it comes to COVID? So the question is, you know, if, if you've gotten chemotherapy, how long might you be immunocompromised with respect to COVID? And uh, if, you are, if your immune system is not working well, whether it's from chemo, whether it's from medicines that you have to take to keep yourself protected from an autoimmune condition, many other reasons why, it varies by person. So the best source of the answer to that question is talk with your oncologist. Talk with your cancer doctor because they have ways to know from how you feel, your story, your history, from your physical exam, from laboratory tests, whether or not your immune system's picking up. And just like we did COVID antibody tests on people from out in the community, um, some doctors will do COVID antibody tests on their patients to see if they have antibodies at a level that might offer protection. But a, a, an antibody number doesn't guarantee protection. There's much more to it. So your personal doctor can also give you advice. Should you get the vaccine? Which one? When should you get it? Should you wear a mask? Is it okay to go to church, to the grocery store? Is it okay to have your kids come and visit? Those are all personal questions that your own personal preferences, your comfort, um, as well as your doctor, your team's advice uh, are needed to answer your really important question. Okay, and my second question is, as someone who received the Pfizer vaccines, I'd like to know how you determine that the Moderna vaccine works better than the Pfizer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we haven't yet published our findings related to Moderna and Pfizer, but what we've been looking at is uh, a time series, looking at the vaccine's effectiveness from alpha to delta to omicron, uh, with respect to death as being the outcome. And looking at who got that vaccine. Moderna would, particularly was popular among a uh, more older population. It, be, it would, became available sooner. Pfizer, interestingly, was available to younger children first. So when parents heard about that, that their teenager or child in elementary school could get the Pfizer vaccine, we suspect, we don't have proof, we speculate that younger parents might have said, hmm, Pfizer for my kid? Yeah, maybe Pfizer for myself. So we see in our own data that seniors are more likely to get Moderna and younger people more likely to get Pfizer. And then as they marched out from the primary series of two to the booster, the third shot, added protection. And the reduction of deaths with Moderna, even in a higher risk population seniors, has been greater than we've seen in Pfizer. It's a little bit because both of them are really awesome. Um, but you know, if you wanna side on the, the margin of protection, I got three Pfizer vaccines and the last one I got, number four, was Moderna. Thank you so much. So my question is, I noticed that you rooted your research in the faith-based community. Um, knowing that we have a history with being concerned with mass vaccinations and um, religious preference, how did you navigate that apprehension that typically happens largely in the African American community? Thank you for that question. One of the things that uh, actually led us to the, the African American uh, church was its leaders, the pastors. Um, we realized that inside the order and structure in our churches, a lot of congregations move collectively by way of lead, being led by their pastor. So the pastoral support was a very integral part of, of making this happen inside of faith communities. 
Um, we also, from, from my perspective, having um, the opportunity to go to various churches and, and visit and speak and talk about uh, this effort, aligning it up with what we say we believe, and that's the word of God. So that actually helped us catapult a better understanding. Did it capture uh, everybody? Absolutely not. Just because you go to church does not mean that you're in the church. <laughs> I think that's it. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Minama Shahid, and uh, I am very much concerned about the community of all human beings and mainly the African-American community, we need to be re-educated on our thought process so that we will be able to use our mind with the creator to help us to understand and to overcome this critical condition that we are in today because it is very critical. But we have to learn how to think how to reason, and how to not just take our mind and listen to all this media about cancer, cancer, this, this, this. We have to try to reframe our minds and keep the creator inside of us and think good thoughts so that we can churn some of this chaotic situation that we're in today. It's here, and it's not going to go away tomorrow. So we have to learn to use our minds. And dear church people, you must get some kind of class to teach our people how to think and how to reason. I see on the YouTube, a lot of Europeans, they are teaching their people. Now I'm for all people, and a lot of Europeans are for all human beings, we know that. But we still have to educate our own people. Thank you very much. Amen, words of wisdom. <laughs> Amen. Any more questions? So, if, I got a question again. So, one of the things that the industry that we're in, um, and I don't know if a lot of service providers have experienced this, but SDC is a mandated vaccine agency. And I find personally in my interview process that many people aren't vaccinated. Um, how, what uh, efforts are being made to uh, reframe and address these populations? Because like Dr. Levy said, not a, a lot of our population isn't under the leadership of a faith-based institution. Are there efforts underway to reach populations who aren't rooted in faith-based efforts and um, don't and, and still have not sought to be vaccinated? My response to uh, that question is, we, yes, the, the community educational sessions that we've talked about that we've been offering has been open to everyone, whether you're of faith or non, uh, or non faith. Um, I think accepting that platform that the uh, young lady over there talked about is a charge to us as individuals of the community. If we learn better, we can do better. Uh, this process of COVID, it hadn't been a pandemic for hundreds of years. And so we have stereotyped ourselves into that box because of what has historically happened to our race uh, years ago. And so we have to entrust someone and somebody in terms of following the process. We have people of color uh, that are part of a number of research teams and doing the work. And if you don't know, now you know, the woman that uh, helped, was instrumental in developing the COVID vaccination was a black woman. Absolutely. So we're, when we talk about putting culturally trust together with what we think, we have to be able to think differently and understand slavery was real. Is it still existed today in terms of its physical um, encapsulment? or are we trying to enslave ourselves through um, our minds? 
So I think social service agencies that require the vaccinations are looking out for the good of the bigger population. And an employer's decision to make it mandated and state's requirements is, I, I would say that I support that. Thank you so and much. The other thing I wanna add to that is that we have to be vigilant in making sure that we're giving the most current information at all times. It's still a choice and we have to respect that. Absolutely. Um, but giving the information and freely giving the information and being consistent in giving the information is gonna be key. Thank you so much. Question? Again, thank you for your very pertinent work. Um, so after the initial study, which we know after, after saw or hindsight is 2020, um, what else do you think you wanted to, to study and what further would you recommend? Are there any, any anomalies in data that just threw you off or, or interesting facts that you'd like to further pursue? Yeah. From my lens, uh, the opportunity exists for our community. RADx does have a RFA out um, in regards to the biggest challenge that we've talked about, engaging community and talking with community and re-educating community about the relevance of COVID. Our society thinks that because the numbers are low that we're over it, um, but many of the scientists and researchers have already revealed to us that COVID more than likely is here to stay just like the influenza. And so um, NIH has a plethora of other sub-studies that will follow out of this RADx uh, study, so. You know, in, in research, there's three kind of stages, uh, phases, approaches that we think about. One is basic science, the second clinical, and the third community. And when it comes to basic science research, some of the key questions that continue are, what's the way to make the best vaccines to stay on top of it? What's the way to come up with medications that work really effectively? How do we get better diagnostic tests, like the tests you do at home or in other settings, and make them really easy to find and use, and also make it easy for people to share the result of their tests uh, anonymously with public databases so we know what's going on in our community. We do surveillance, for example, of our sewage systems to see if there's viruses in it. You know, if we had people that shared willingly what's happening in their lives, that would help us a lot. But not to know details, not to be policing it, just to be aware of what's happening. In the clinical area, there's a lot of interest in trying to better understand long COVID chronic COVID, that brain fog, the anxiety, the shortness of breath, many people suffering for months or now even year, over a year. So we really need to better understand how to assess it, how to treat it, how to manage it. And then finally with community is things that we've talked about here today. How do we get people interested in self-protection, in taking advantage of the vaccines? How do we communicate effectively? How do we work with mind, body, and spirit to advance our well-being as a community. Those are also social science questions that uh, interest uh, people in those fields. And the academic community partnerships are critical to answering many of those questions. This is a little bit off key as to what you guys are talking about, but I think there's some similarities to um, the impact. So all of us is trying to get people to do research that would help us with um, design of future medicines. But again, we find some struggles in our community where people aren't interested in being part of a research. And I think it's important that we begin to, to communicate how important it is for us to participate in the process and not be left behind. And I just think there's opportunities for a partnership across research type efforts that might help uh, give uh, uh, a weight to why it's important for us to not only understand, yes, that there's been some hiccups in research in the past, but we can't afford not to participate in the future. Thank you for that, Dr. Hinton. Um, all of us, the All of Us Research Project, 
gives us that opportunity to have that voice and be a part of the research uh, that's going on in medicine um, and in the science. Uh, the black and brown community has not always had uh, leverage and been a part of the, had the seat at the table and this gives us that opportunity. Um, medicine, the science will uh, allow us to uh, be able to be a part of that. Um, it's going to be nice to be able to know that when I go to the doctor or my kids go to the doctor, that medicine, that their doctors are going to be able to be more precise about the health care that they are in need of because I am a part of this project. Hello, everyone. I'm Karen Dodson. I'm the program director for the All of Us Research Program at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And I just wanted to thank everybody up on the stage because they have been so supportive of our program. And it's so important for us to know in our community what research is all about. And that's what the All of Us Research Program really does. So we educate people at churches. We educate people in the community. We do pop-ups. We do digital enrollment for people. So we do all these things so you will have a better understanding of the program. So I wanted to let you know that, you know, our community is so frightened of research because historically of what has happened. And so we need to really just understand, like the information that was presented today with Dr. Moyer, it really shows us what research can do. And so our program is here to really help people. We have over 6,000 people right now enrolled in Wisconsin. We have over 500,000 in the state, I mean in the country. Mm -hmm. And so we are also a location, we have various locations at the medical college, at greater clinics, and some of the other community clinics we've been doing and partnering with like UCC, with Al's program, 16th Street Clinic, Outreach Community Clinic. Mm -hmm. Also, we're starting to work with Progressa. And also, Is that? <laughs> we see birds. <laughs> um, so I just want to let you know that we are in the community. We are working with churches. We meet with pastors. But we also work with community organizations like the Social Development Commission. With George, he's a part of our program. He's also on the Community Advisory Board. So I want you to understand and know the importance of what research is, and I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Great round of applause for Karen. Thank you. I just want to, we, we, we're getting ready to move. I'm going to call uh, Chantel Sane to the stage for the workshop transitions, but I wanted to um, just make sure that I heard your presentation. You said in your presentation that for people who are unvaccinated, there is a, we know that there's an assumption that once you have the virus, um, that it makes you immune. But did I not hear you say that every time you get that virus and you're unvaccinated, it makes you, it weakens you, it makes you more susceptible to ultimately uh, death? Not quite. Okay. If you're infected and you've got a normal immune system, you're not immunocompromised, you make antibodies. Your body learns how to fight it. Okay. That's good. Okay. Um, and that protection may last for months, but that's to the variant that you're exposed to. And as the virus mutates from alpha to delta to omicron and who knows what next, that past immunity will be to a spike protein, to a kind of virus that your body might not be as accustomed to. So the research shows us that if you get the combination of both the past infection and the vaccine a few months later, and if you get more vaccines, your immune system gets stronger. You have more antibodies over time. If you have an immune system that works well, if you've got chemotherapy, autoimmune condition, maybe not and that's where you need your doctor's advice. So the CDC slide said, yeah, past infection, we get it. That does provide protection, but if you want to add extra protection, get the vaccine. Excellent. Round of applause for Dr. Moyer.
Dr. Desi Levy and Priscilla Wallace.